Um, good morning, everybody, and for those online and here in the sanctuary, my name is Jeff Kuse. Um, I am a professor at Seattle Pacific University and member here at Bethany, and it's always just a gift to be able to open God's Word with you um, today. Today, as Nathan mentioned earlier, is Pentecost Sunday. It's a day globally uh, of celebration throughout the centuries of the church, where today we celebrate the birth of the church. God pouring the Holy Spirit upon this gathered group of people during the festival of Pentecost, and this explosion, this literal ign- this ignition of God's power, um, like flames falling from heaven, um, and then the church is born in this moment. A few weeks back, I actually preached on Acts chapter 2, which references that. Um, But this week, as we move into the letter to the Philippians, which will be part of our flame series as we look deeper at these letters to the church in the coming weeks, um, I want to take a look at the aftershocks of that event today. Uh, What does it mean for us to have and hold on to the Holy Spirit today? Pentecost is often viewed as a past event by many people. We look at the history of the church thousands of years ago, this birth of excitement. But in the 21st century, what does Pentecost have to do with us, and particularly this church of Philippi that we'll be looking at in more depth? Paul is writing this letter to the church of Philippi because the fires of Pentecost, even in the few decades that the church has moved forward, has started to get cold, has started to get, you know, a little bit not as hot as it used to be. It's a bit like waking up at a, on a campsite and you come out of your tent and you're at the campfire and the campfire from the last night is in your memory and you can kind of smell it, but it's cold to the touch now. It's, it's just coals and burnt wood that you see. And like a forgotten campfire that's grown cold, this is a bit of what Paul's concern is for the church of Philippi. This explosion of growth in a matter of decades some 60 years later, has already become to seem cold and in some ways forgotten by this early church. Paul is essentially calling the church back uh, to Leviticus. In Leviticus chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, the Levitical priests are told in no uncertain terms, hear these words, the fire on the altar shall be kept burning. It shall not go out. Every morning the priest shall add wood to it. Lay out the burnt offering on it, and then repeat it in verse 13 for emphasis. A perpetual fire shall be kept burning. It shall not go out. This is a job description for us today. Our job is to keep the fire burning. It is to bring wood to the fire, to build it up, to make it a bonfire for the world to see. The job has a job, the church has a job description before us, given to us by the Holy Spirit, to be that light, that heat in the world. In Macedonia, around 61 AD, this church, this church of Philippi, was being formed in this city of Philippi, and it's the first formalized Christian community to be established on what we now call European soil in this time. Philippi had this unique location historically as well as geographically as being a trade route and a cultural route between the East and the West. Ideas are flowing through the city. It was a port city where a lot of energy is coming, a lot of things are happening, And as we hear in 1 Thessalonians 2, as well as in Acts 16, which is part of your reading if you're following along in the Flame series this week, this small church faced a lot of opposition given the culture that it was growing in. As it was trying to grow and get a sense of identity, there's constant ideas that are flowing around it, much like the city of Seattle. A lot of innovation, a lot of progressiveness, a lot of ways of trying to look back and hold on to the past. I mean, all of these things are challenging this young church, and that's why it makes it such an important letter for us today. One of the things I thought of as an image of what Paul is trying to do in this letter uh, this letter to the Philippians, is this church of Philippi, came to me as I was thinking about a hike that my family took on the Solduck River out on the Olympic Peninsula a few years back. Um, if you follow the Solduck and you're kind of going along the river, you'll see in the midst of the Solduck um, the remnants of large western red cedar trees. Some of them 100 feet tall when they were growing have fallen into the river. And over time, the river has beaten and formed these chunks of this tree. And because of mineral deposits and all of that, they, 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 they've withstood a certain kind of core identity. There are these big chunks of wood that are in the middle of the river that are no longer being beaten down. They are like sentinels in the middle of it. Foresters actually have a term for what happens. These are called tree hearts, tree hearts. It's like the very core of a tree being preserved against all the things that are beating against it. 
And this is a lot of what I think Paul is trying to get us to look at in the letter to the Philippians, which is what is the heart that will remain amidst the rushing river of our world around us? What's going to be the core heart of the church that will be preserved for us? And so as we look deeply at this letter to the Philippians, and we're going to be going throughout the letter in kind of bits and pieces, so there's a lot of Philippians you'll get this morning. I want, you to, I want to suggest three basic concepts of the church that are essential to remember, and it's in your bulletin in the outline as well. First, what form does the church take in the world? What are we called to do? And Paul's going to remind them of their form. Second, what content animates this form in the world for the sake of the gospel? And third, where does the meaning of the cross and the resurrection power challenge us and move us to be salt and light for the sake of the gospel. What is the church's form? What is its content? And what is its meaning in the world? And in your bulletin, you'll see three ways in which I'm going to play that out. And first, I want to talk a little bit about the form of the church that Paul challenges to, uh, about between what's called a bounded set and a centered set mentality. In Philippians 3 that Nathan read, Paul speaks of breaking with the past, um, turning away from maybe toxic nostalgia or, or things that have happened to us that maybe have caused us so much scarring that we don't know how to move forward. He's trying to get them to look forward. In, in, in chapter 3, 13 and 14, he puts it this way, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal, towards the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul here is again using an athletic analogy, and he likes to use language of the people, the things that they would relate to, and athletics would have been something that that city, as much as the city of Seattle, also understands as far as a way of thinking about our world. Pressing on towards the goal, the word, Greek word there, scopus, and towards the prize, bra- brabion, this idea of moving towards something beyond the goal, is what he puts in stake. And these are two different words, goal and prize. To have a goal is to have a plan. And Paul is very explicit about you need to have a plan. There's a goal you are working on. There's a task you are working on. It takes these kind of things to get us from point A to point B. But what can happen is that our goal can be seen as the prize, and that is a mistake and can cause us a lot of damage. Over this past few months, I've been training to summit Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. It's a a mountain that many of you may be familiar with, 19,341 feet. So when you think about Mount Rainier at 14,410 feet, this is another 5,000 feet up in elevation. It's a massive, massive summit. And I've been working for months in training. I've been um, (laughs) running. I've been carrying a backpack full of weight. I've been doing elevation training. I've been trying to get my VO max up. I've been changing my nutrition. And the team of eight of us that are working on this are constantly looking at our Fitbits and kind of looking at all the metrics to make sure that we're on because this elevation is real. The work of climbing that high is real. But the goal is not the prize that we're doing. As much as we are excited about the prospect of climbing Mount Kilimanjaro, which seems so epic to even say out loud, it's not the prize. Because this group that we're gathering together are are a group working with Opportunity International, which is an NGO. And our goal is another mountain, which is women who are in Malawi who have been abandoned by their husbands and left with their children to raise. And they're living on 50 cents a day and are in grinding global poverty. When I am out there running, when I'm out there preparing, it can be really easy for me to get lost on, man, I really want to crush it on my Strava today. I really want to make sure my metrics are great. I really want to make sure I've got all my fundraising in place, right? I want to get all that done. I'm looking at all these metrics and panicking about this stuff, but that is not the prize. There is another mountain that we're working for, and that mountain is these women, and their faces, and their names, and their stories that they're doing. If I don't get to summit Mount Kilimanjaro, that's not the loss. <laughs> if I'm not caring for these women and what they're doing, then that could be a loss as well. So one of the things that I think of when I think of a bounded set and a centered set is to remember that what we need to do is fo- focus our eyes like Paul calls us to on the prize. So Paul is challenging us to see what we always must look at, which is beyond the goals to the real prize, the real purpose, the real reason that Christ came, Christ died, and that Christ rose again in power. That is what we should focus on. 
If we think that our goals are the main focus, like for example, how well I memorize scripture, how many programs we have in our church, what attendance we give on a Sunday, is a, well, the numbers on a Sunday, what our giving is for the month, if those alone become our goals, we could miss the prize entirely. Those goals are vital, but without going beyond it, then we'll never discover the prize is what Paul is trying to get the church to think of. Another way to think about this um, in this bounded set, center set idea was really articulated by Paul Hebert, a missiologist who in the 80s clearly articulated this idea of the way that churches were trying to develop in um, post-World War II. As the church was kind of getting its identity after the World Wars, there was this real sense that churches were trying to double down on their identity. Um, the world was fractured, the world was violent, uh, and churches started to spring up in America and all throughout Europe with a different plan, the, the growth of mega churches in the 60s through the 80s. This idea of building more buildings and more programs became part of it. And Paul Hebert was thinking about churches doubling down on that as what he called a bounded set. To be a bounded set community is to be bound by managing borders of a community, he found. Where are the walls? Where's the place that I know that I'm in and somebody else is out? A centered set community, he said, focuses on the center point of a community. You're facing towards a centering presence, always moving closer and closer and closer to the essential, the heart, the tree heart, in the middle of the river of the world, um, that center point. So we're looking not at walls, not at doors, not at locks on doors that prevent other people from seeing it. This is really articulated well by Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah in chapter two. When Zechariah is being asked to rebuild Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity, this, the, the city of Jerusalem is destroyed, the temple is destroyed. And he decides to start measuring. He starts in chapter two, start measuring how to build the city. And God sends an envoy to literally stop these attempts to measure. And we hear this in Zechariah. Jerusalem shall be inhabited like unwalled villages because of the multitude of people and animals in it. For I will be a, fire, a wall of fire around it, says the Lord, and I will be the glory within. So how do churches become bounded sets as opposed to villages without walls is my question. So here let me throw you some numbers. And, I'm, and, and believe me, it's going to be a little bit of a number dump for about 30 seconds, so I pre, so apologize for that. For about six and a half years, I've been working on a research study with a number of researchers, both nationally as well as some global partners as well, theologians and church pastors, looking at churches today. According to the National Congregational Study Survey, there are approximately 380,000 churches in America today, give or take. And while the average U.S. congregation is in a building, it, the average building seats about 200 in America right now. But in that building that can seat 200, about 65 attend an immediate, a median-sized church every Sunday. And that's the median. So that means that half of all churches right now, 380,000, have fewer than 65 people in their weekly worship service. According to Gallup, three in 10 Americans say they attend religious services every week, or almost every week. But while reporting 11% in this, many of them say 56% will only or seldom attend even in one month. Two decades ago, an average of 42% of US Americans said that they attended a service every week. But then only 10 days ago, so a difference of 10 years, that number dropped to 38%, and currently the number is 30. So in a matter of 30 years, we've seen a drop from 48% to 30, and that number is going down. If you look at regression lines and statistics, that doesn't look good at all. So as I work with congregations, I meet with clergy, I'm driving, I'm sitting down having conversations with them, I'm meeting with young adults, I'm meeting with pastors, I'm meeting with church leaders and theologians. Panic is in the eyes and stress is in the heart. How do we stop the bleed is kind of the question. You know, how do we get people to hear about what we're doing? How do we get people in the door? What, what's gonna work? What's working at other churches? And I wanna say this really clearly and it's be behind me. With scarcity, comes anxiety, with anxiety comes a hunger for control, and with a hunger for control will come a bounded set mentality. A bounded set mentality. We have the temptation in times of scarcity to start locking the doors, to start doubling down on what works, to make sure that we get back to what is our core market, our core brand, right? And that kind of mentality can create a sense of us and them, a bounded set, what's on the wall, what's working over there, as opposed to what is in the center calling us to live for Jesus. 
One of the great examples of this I see in the Gospels is in Mark chapter 5, when Jesus is trying to expand the reach of the church. He literally sails across the sea, going to start the ministry to the Gentiles, the land of Gerasenes we hear in Mark chapter 5. And when he lands on the shore, he's encountered by a man who's been kicked out of his community. He's been kicked out of his city. He's raging with demons inside of him. He's literally chained in a place of tombs. He's called the man of the tombs. And with chains, he's bound to this place to keep him from not bothering the other people. And he breaks his chains. He breaks out and he comes rushing to Jesus who has just landed on the shore. And in verse seven, starts screaming at Jesus, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, do not torture me. And Jesus sees this man who's been excluded, who's been pushed outside of the boundaries of the community. He looks at him and he responds with a question larger than that which has been asked. Typical of Jesus, a bigger question answers the question. And it's an encircling question of the circumference of love as it begins to expand, as we'll talk about. And in verse eight, he identifies the man fully, he looks him in his face, in his pain, and then the promise of what he can be. And he asks this question in verse nine. And then Jesus asked him, what is your name? What is your name? Seemingly benign question, but very important for this bounded set versus centered set mentality. In Revelation 2, 17, we hear the promise that the end of all time will finally face Jesus with what the Irish poet W.B. Yeats calls the face and the name that we had before the world was made. And as we hear in Revelation, we will be given some hidden manna and I, God, will give you a white stone. And on the white stone will be written a new name that no one knows except for the ones who receive it. In a bounded set situation, we are marked by the names that are given us that can exclude us from the very center of the community. Names we either take on ourselves and refuse to let God separate from us, or names that we are being told we have to adhere to in order to get access to these communities. Names like shame, trauma, forgotten, despised, failure, loss, and I can go on and on and on. This level of inadequacy about I'll never fully belong, no matter how much I work in this church, I'm never fully a part of it. Or even if I try to access it, if they ever knew the fullness of me, the full story of me, how would they ever possibly be able to accept me in the insider group? It's like darts being thrown at us in like some dark pub where we're the target and we're hit over and over and over by these names in our world, and we think that's who we are. This illusion that this is the name that we are going to be called at the end of time. But there is a name that God holds for you, that God wants you to hear. And the church is supposed to be stewarding this name to others. You are forgiven. You are holy and lovely and beautiful and accepted. You belong here. You're why the cross happened. You're why resurrection power happened. You belong here. So my question that I want you to ponder a bit as we kind of get deeper into this text is this. How have we as a community created a bounded set? How have we locked people away amidst tombs with change forged by labels and names that are not the name given by Jesus, which is written on a white stone and ready for us to receive at the end of all things? Why are we not calling each other by the true name of Christ now and in this place. And so this brings me to a time of thinking about content. So if the form of the church is about bounded sets and centered sets ideas, are we centering on the person of Jesus or are we centering on that which separates us as in and out people? Content is what we fill this space with to be the church. Paul begins his letter in, with an amazing statement. To all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, with all the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. To understand what it means to be part of the centered set community on Christ, to focus on the life, death, and resurrection and power of Jesus, requires that like this demoniac, this man of the tombs in Mark 5, that we hear, understand, and fully embrace our true name and identity in Christ, but also that for others as well. And this is what I'm going to be calling Purity codes versus compassion. Paul makes it clear that we are saints, he says, for all the saints. And this is an amazing statement. You are a saint 
that God loves from the very foundation of the world. That is your name, that's your identity. And it's not just insiders, but it's for all. All people have been given this name. As we hear from C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, he makes this point clear that there are no mere mortals that we'll ever meet. All people are of eternal consequence, eternally ready to be redeemed and set free for God's fire and love for what God has in store. Everyone we meet is valued by God and to be cherished. Saints are not merely people of the past. You are saints who God wants to develop and grow in the gospel. Philippians 2 is a space where in Paul's letter, he wants the church to be reminded of this call to what it means to build compassion as opposed to just purity codes that exclude by giving them a song. In Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11, Paul provides this hymn of Jesus, the one who, was, who made himself nothing, taking on the form of a slave. And by making himself nothing, called the church to be formed like him, morphe, to be formed like him. When Christ makes himself nothing for our sake, he makes space for us in him. And when the church becomes formed around Christ, we are now equipped by making ourselves nothing to make space for others. So we are not without room for others to join us. We are not too crowded to have others come into our space. It's a vocation and calling to make space for others, and this is what the hymn of Christ is calling the church to as well. To be filled with Christ's identity, therefore, the church makes more and more space for others as Christ makes space for us, making himself nothing. And in this way, we become a place and a people of compassionate openness. We're always ready to receive. Our doors are flung open. We are ready to receive those who God brings to our community rather than block access through purity codes and labels that they themselves have been freed from because of the cross of Christ. To be formed as a church of compassion also comes with a great bonus, real lasting joy. Over 75 times in the letter, we hear over and over again that joy is the serious business of heaven, that we are a people of joy who bring that joy to the world and they get to see through the way we live together what it means to live as a people of joy. It's a joy that knows the reality of loss but also knows the hope that comes in and through faith. And it's the joy that we are not alone. As you look around the sanctuary, you are not alone. There are people here who love you, who are ready to support you and help you. This is what joy is about. Paul makes this clear in chapter one, verse four. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who has begun a good work will carry it to completion, and that word teleos, to the very end in the day of Christ Jesus. So lastly, if we are turning and facing Jesus, as opposed to all these ways that we kind of create community around boundaries, if we open our hearts in the song of Christ to be made nothing so we can make more and more space of compassion for all that God wants to do in us and through us, then what is the meaning of that? What is, how are we going to show that to the world? Well, this is where we get between measured and measurelessness in how we express the fullness of love. At the beginning of Paul's letter that we are looking at today in Philippians, verse 9 of chapter 1, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and insight. And then later in chapter four, verses 12 to 13, that Nathan read, I know what it is to have little. I know what it is to have plenty. And in any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The repetition that Paul uses in the Greek idiomatic way that he talks about more and more is this ever-expanding infinitive nature of this love that he wants the community to express. It is measurelessness. It, It just keeps on going. And what Paul wants us to live as a church is not about a measured sense of love, not a measured sense of compassion, but a boundless sense of compassion that continues on. It will mean going out into the highways and byways of this land and proclaiming a love that is moving us beyond our words and stirs us into effective action. It's about supporting and not just those who are easy to love, but those who are difficult. It means risking not being able to measure whether it matters or not to anybody except for the call that Christ has put on your heart. When I was a doctoral student in in Scotland and then later when I was on faculty, 
Um, I was at the University of Glasgow, and I served um, in the divinity faculty as a faculty member, but I was also assistant minister of the Glasgow Cathedral. I was a member of the, Glas- of the Church of Scotland there. And part of my appointment was that I insisted with Sunday worship, but also I was also part of Wednesday afternoon prayers. Now, this cathedral is the oldest cathedral in mainland Scotland. It was uh, laid, the first stones were laid in 1136, to give you a sense of time stamping on that. Um, but it took until the mid-13th century to actually complete this cathedral. It's this massive neo-Gothic cathedral, absolutely stunning uh, to take a look at. So when I would lead these mid- midday prayers, um, I would have to kind of get to the the church very quickly. They didn't have a car. Glasgow's a massive city. So basically it would go like this. On Wednesdays, I would rush out of a freshman seminar teaching the English department. I would have this duffel bag that had my cassock and my dog collar that I would wear to the cathedral when I got there. So I'd grab this bag. I'd rush out of there. I'd try to catch a bus. Hopefully the bus was on time, which rarely it was. I'd get on this bus. I'd kind of get across the city finally get to the cathedral's precinct on the other side of Glasgow, get out of there, run to the sacristy, get my cassock on, get my dog collar on, go out to the prayer desk and sit there ready to pray. And most Wednesdays, nobody was there. Nobody. It was empty. Um, This cathedral is a beautiful space, but as far as a living, breathing church community, it's dwindled into next to nothing. Um, It's a place of civic awards. It's a place of great concerts you can go to attend. But Wednesday afternoon prayers, very, very few times in the years that I was there did I see a soul in the sanctuary. I was alone. And I can tell you that all the effort that took to grabbing that bag, leaving these freshmen who are asking questions about a novel, hitting, uh, getting on a bus, rushing out there, getting all the funny clothes on, getting out sitting there ready to pray, it seemed like a lot of effort for not much return on investment. The ROI was pretty low from what I could see. Why was I doing this? What was the point of it? Right? What was I even doing? And as usual, I'm asking the wrong questions. Because I was asking the question of how it mattered. How could I measure it? What was the impact that was going to be? Was there enough people? Did we get the right people in the room? That kind of thing. The question that God was asking me by virtue of my ordination was, I want you to be there and pray. Whether anybody comes or not. That's your job. <laughs> your job is to be there to be the presence of Christ in that space, whether anybody ever sees you doing it at all. And much of the church is called to do things that are not measurable, and that's really hard. The things that we're called to do, nobody knows how to measure it, and nobody can show you whether it's worth it or not. It's gonna be foolishness. It's gonna seem absolutely ridiculous, but the prize is bigger than the goals. (laughs) The prize is bigger than the goals. And are we ready to move into that space? Are we ready to be the church that God wants us to be of a measureless form of love? So here's the point in the sermon where I'm going to give a big shout out to anybody from a STEM background or a math background or the engineers in the room. I want to tell you this, math matters in the kingdom of God. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Math matters in the kingdom of God, and here's why. The people who told you geometry wouldn't matter were completely wrong, because I'm about ready to tell you about geometry in the middle of a sermon. So, uh, there we go, right? So the circumference of a circle, right? If you're trying to figure out how to figure out the circumference of a circle, very basic formula where you, to calculate the circumference, you need to know what the diameter is. And in order to get that, you look at half of that, which is called the radius, right? And, you, and two times pi times radius is going to give you the circumference of a circle, Right? Very basic thing that most of you in middle school and high school probably have nailed, right? Or conveniently forgotten. Um, but the radius, that, that number, is, it can be changed, right? If the radius is different, your circle's going to be smaller, it's going to be bigger. And I tell you what, there's a lot of people who want to know the number of that radius. How big is this circle supposed to be in the church? How far is it supposed to reach? Well, I'm here to tell you based on Paul and what Paul wants us to do with this more and more love abounding is the radius is infinite. The radius is infinite. It's just going to keep growing. And you and I and our work with with the communion of saints who have gone before us and the ones who are going to go after us, we don't get to know where that's going to end. That's not our job. (laughs) It's not what we do. We just follow where it's going to go. Jesus says, follow me not measure the radius. 
The circumference of love is going to be expanding through the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is a day that shows us the power of the, of the Holy Spirit and the flames of fire that want to burn for this world. We don't know how big this circle is going to get. We don't know who God wants to include. That's not our job. Our job is not to build the walls. Our job is not to create codes that prevent them to getting in or out. Our job is to be attentive to the center of this story, which is Jesus Christ. And in paying attention to who Jesus is, our compassion will expand and grow. You will love people you didn't ever expect you would love 10 years ago, five years ago, two weeks ago. If you allow yourself to pay attention to who Christ is and what Christ wants to do in you. And it will be measureless. And our meaning as a church of an ever-expanding circumference of love will be seen by the world. To be formed as a centered set church facing Jesus completely and honestly, to be filled with the content of compassion that we sing with the life of Jesus articulated in chapter two of Philippians as one who made himself nothing and therefore made space for you and for me and for all the saints, then we now have jet fuel to follow the measureless radius, and I'm gonna quote this one because it's awesome, to infinity and beyond, right? where the circumference of love will expand beyond all that we can imagine or hope for. The circle is growing in our lifetime and after our lifetime. The church is the place that God wants to work. And you are the church. God wants to use you to carry wood, to build the fire. David Bentley Hart, who's a theologian I respect quite a bit at Notre Dame, Orthodox theologian, had this to say, I'm just going to finish with these words as we move into our time of final worship and prayer. I have no emotional investment in Christianity in the abstract, but only in a certain vision of God's dealing with humanity in and through a crucified slave who, impossibly enough, is the center of all human history and the very form of God. It's only the figure of Christ, the peasant agitated, radical lover of the poor, murdered by the state and the interest of the enfranchised, but still a boundless source of love and forgiveness. The good shepherd who never abandons even one of his sheep that holds me in place. And my prayer for you is that you will be held in the loving arms of Jesus this day. Not just for your own sake, but for the sake of the world. Because God needs you to bring wood to the fire. To keep this fire burning. And I believe Bethany is that church to do that. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this time of worship for sitting with your letter to the church of Philippi, which seems so current and so ready for us to embrace. Soften our hearts, O Lord, to make it hearts ready for compassion for our world as we center our face upon you, who calls us by our true and lasting name to be sent from this world of measureless love, of ever-increasing reaches of how your love is to be expressed in our world. Equip us as we continue in our worship, Lord, to do that work. We ask through your Holy Spirit. Amen.